<clears throat> okay, I guess I guess that must be it. All right. Well, good morning to good our morning. second session on um, prophecy in the end time. Uh, before we get started, I think it's very appropriate, of course, that we open in prayer. Would you join me, please? Our gracious Father in heaven, we truly thank you for the privilege you continually allow us to have be able to join together in fellowship and instruction of your word. Father, uh, this morning, I thank you for every individual that is here. I ask that you um, just guide us, each one, with your Holy Spirit to help us understand what is being shared from your word. Help me, Lord, to present the material in a way that is understandable and that is led by your Holy Spirit and that will be right on target with your word and proper interpretation. So, Father, I turn this time over to you now, thanking you for the privilege that you give us to be able to still uh, be able to join together as we are this evening, this morning, I mean. And so I want to give you this thanks and praise in Christ's saving name. Amen. Okay, first of all, for those who don't know it, and uh, these are being recorded for the church website. And I um, need to bring that to your attention, number one, two things, that might impact your note taking. Number two is that the, there I'm gonna have some slides that I will not be able to use my laser printer on. I'm a laser printer, my laser pointer. And because when I do, I'm away from the microphone. So what I'm going to do instead is whenever I uh, describe something on one of the charts, I will start from left to right. And therefore, uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow uh, what I'm sharing, even though it'll be brief on each one just to give you an idea of what the chart is sharing. So anyway, with that being said, I want to start today's session with some reminders uh, from last week on this subject. Uh, I want to remind you, of course, that uh, good knowledge of uh, Bible prophecy as well as the Bible really depends on proper understanding and how we interpret God's message. And there are two scriptures I think that are extremely helpful. Uh, one I pointed out, maybe both of them last week, but they're helpful in helping us um, really get a grasp of God's word. Uh, the first one, oh, and by the way, I wanted to start out with a little comedy because it's a heavier session. So we'll move into the tough stuff now. Anyway, there are two scriptures uh, that um, I believe that are extremely important, and they tell us about this trusting God's scriptures and why they are authoritative, they can be trusted, and also that there is only one God meaning interpretation, one interpretation, and that's what God desires to be interpreted. So the first scripture is 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. And, it, and basically it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This basically tells us that every word is God-breathed. It's from God in the original. It makes us complete, and it makes us completely equipped. Now, the second scripture, 2 Peter 1, 20, 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And I mentioned this last week as well, but this basically tells us that one interpretation, God's, whatever he meant, we are trying to decipher, trying to determine. And the prophecy, the word prophecy has in this scripture has to do with speaking forth the mind and the counsel of God. I think that you recognize that there's, um, the science of hermeneutics is extremely important when we talk about Bible interpretation, which is so important in itself. And we've talked about a little bit about this last week. Uh, please recall that good 
hermeneutics of, or Bible interpretation is absolutely critical to understand the Bible and understanding prophecy. Uh, the three top critical hermeneutics to keep in mind when we interpret scripture, read scripture, study scripture, are first to interpret literally, unless the passage obviously intended to be symbolic or there are figures of speech. And that tells us also that we're not maybe to take this exactly what he said, like the Lord has wings. Uh, the, se the second is to interpret historically, grammatically, and contextually. Grammatically, as we mentioned last week, has to do with the nuances of the Hebrew and Greek. That can be very, very important in interpretation. Also, what's left is context, context, context. That is critical. And then the third rule is to let scripture interpret scripture. If you're studying an issue, study all of what God's word has to say on that issue. If there are key words in that particular scripture, find out where they're used elsewhere, especially by the same author in the same context or general context so you can determine what the real meaning is. Prophecy and its fulfillment is one of the greatest evidences that we have really that the Bible is from God. And accurate fulfillment of the detail that is given in some of these prophecies gives us complete confidence that this is God's word. We can depend upon what it says and what he says in the, for the future happenings are going to take place exactly as he stated they will. So where are we going, what are we, how are we going to approach this extremely big subject? And I think you could see how big it is from the uh, handout last week uh, regarding what all the information that I'm gonna to try to cover through the seven or so weeks that we're going to be together. As you know, this is extremely complex and it encompasses different events and varying views regarding maybe definitions of the event even and also the timing of the events. I can really only attempt to establish a foundation uh, for your understanding of these events and the history that leads up to those events. To provide you a description also of the main events and their generally recognized sequence. And then thirdly, uh, to share some fundamental differences in views regarding these events. And then finally, after the basic information, to get into more detail on the end time and share uh, some of the reasoning behind the different views on the key events and their timing. Today's agenda, let's take a look. Um, as much as I'd like to spend a lot more time on today and from what I'm gonna end up spending on today's time, I've got 45 minutes, so I'm not going to be cover everything I wanted to today. It'll overlap into next week. But we'll begin with a big picture, which includes an overview through the 1,000 year millennium by the rule of Christ. We're gonna look at five big events of Genesis and their relationship with Revelation and with the end time. We'll define some end time terms and related prophecies, including 70 weeks of Daniel with an introduction to the last or the 70th week of Daniel. We'll look at God's purposes for the 70 weeks of Daniel and that becomes extremely important. We'll look at the phrase day of the Lord which is used throughout the scriptures. We'll then define some terms. One important one is resurrections. What's the resurrection all about? We'll end today's session with an introduction to the event called the rapture. So put on your seat belts, grab your coffee, and let's get started. I'd like to see the big picture whenever I start teaching or studying anything. And uh, before I get into the details, 
to understand uh, the end time prophecy, I really think that's uh, very, very helpful. So before looking at the, <coughs> excuse me, the end time prophecy and the end time events, I'd like to look at the beginnings and the, uh, that established the endings that we see in the book of Revelation. I believe that will greatly help in our understanding of what has taken place and what is going to take place, which essentially is God's plan. A first step in setting a foundation for understanding is the big picture. So let's look at a slide that will um, put history into perspective for us. And this slide basically shows creation from the left all the way to returning to the right. It shows you the events that are taking place, the critical events that are taking place, showing the first coming of Christ, showing what happens between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Basically, and then the rapture event is stuck in there as well. It also then shows you what's coming after the second coming of Christ which is after the close of the tribulation period or the 70th week of Daniel and moves into the thousand year millennium period of Christ's rule. Then we see some of the things that happened at the very end with Satan and then the movement into eternity. Now let's look at the big picture. The theme of Genesis 1 through 11 is man's increasing alienation from God. The theme of Genesis 12 through the book of Revelation is God's re reconciliation to man. Genesis 1 through 15 talks about five of humanity's significant events that have a great impact on the end time. These are creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, and Nimrod, and then the Abrahamic Covenant. Now the first big event, of course, is creation. And this is when God created the heavens and the earth, then mankind, men and women, and what he called the first Adam. God instructed them to be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth. He gave to sinless man the tenant possession of the earth to administer on his behalf. Now God gave Adam the possession of the earth as his inheritance forever, according to Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. Also Psalm 115, verse 16. Okay, second big event. The fall. Well, we know what happened. Satan deceived man and woman, enticed a disobedience to God, bringing sin. And with man's disobedience, God then placed a curse on the earth. And Satan became the new tenant possessor, possessor of the earth. Mankind therefore lost the tenant possession the administration of man's inheritance, the earth. Remember, God said that Satan is the prince of this world and the prince of the power of the air. And that's said in John 12, 31, uh, John 14, 30, Ephesians 2, 2, and Luke 4, 5 through 7. Do you think God, God was trying to get a point across to us? Satan essentially usurped the tenant possession of the earth from man. This becomes very important. So what did God do? Well, Genesis 3.15 tells us that God announced that he would bring forth the seed of a woman, as we know Christ the Messiah, to inflict a fatal blow upon Satan. So what did Satan then do, or begin to do? He began to find ways to thwart God's plan, his intended plan and really to do him in or to bring him to justice. Throughout history, Satan has been making attempts to do exactly this. But what did he initially do? Satan tried to corrupt the lineage of the human race by enticing the sons of God 
to cohabitate and marry the daughters of men, according to Genesis 6, 2 through 4, as well as Jude 6. Most scholars believe this refers to the fallen angels, taking on the form of man in order to marry and bear children. With what result? Well, the result was the corruption of the ancestry line of humankind. God saw this as stopping the future birth of his Redeemer. Great wickedness existed at this time, and man's kind heart was only evil, according to Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8. Well, what did God then do? He pronounced that he would destroy the world in 120 years, Genesis 6, 3 due to all this evil and the corrupted gene pool that existed. He did this, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this brings us to the third big event, the flood. But God saved eight who had not yet been infected by this deadly contamination, Noah and his family. After the flood, what was God's instruction? To Noah, Genesis 9.1 quotes this, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The exact same statement, exhortation, instruction as given to Adam and Eve. So what did then Satan do next? Well, he used Nimrod considered as a rebel before the Lord. Nimrod was the prime mover in building both Babylon and the Tower of Babel. And this brings us to the fourth big event, the Tower of Babel and Nimrod. Now Satan used, uses Nimrod, the grandson of Ham and the great-grandson of Noah. Nimrod was a responsible for establishing a counterfeit religious system, its basis been used throughout all, basically all cultures of history. But beyond this, the purpose of Nimrod was to build a single kingdom, which disobeyed God who said, fill the earth. Babylon was this kingdom. Nimrod founded ba Babel, which was to become Babylon. The Tower of Babel was to be a symbol of man's power. And ancient writings tell us it was also to better view the heavenly bodies, supporting the practice of astrology and the worship of the sun, S-U-N. It really established a counterfeit religious system, the worshiping the sun as the creator. We see Babylon and its counterfeit religion again in the 70th week of Daniel. Now, according to ancient writings, and this is outside the Bible, these are ancient writings, but from pretty good source, Nimrod's wife became the queen of heaven and the high priestess and established a defiance of God among humanity. These ancient writings also say that Nimrod then died. He became the sun god, S-U-N. He then miraculously impregnated his wife through a sunbeam, who gave birth to a son by way of a counterfeit virgin birth. Beginning to sound familiar? The son was killed, came to life again after 40 days. A counterfeit resurrection. This began the worship of a counterfeit mother and son. The false religion has been seen throughout history and in many, many cultures. In Rome, as an example, it was Venus and her son Cupid. And there are many other examples. From Babylon has emerged many, if not most, of the counterfeit religions of history. Has Satan continued to thwart God's plan? To bring, Satan to, um, base, to bring Satan to his eternal justice and to give Israel her land back and to take back the possession of the earth for man, I'd like you to consider some things, about five. 
How about the birth of Moses? What did he do there? Try to make sure Moses didn't get born. How about Herod killing all the children of a certain age in order to make sure the baby Christ didn't live? How about Hitler and the destruction of the Jews in the Second World War? What about ISIS and the other religions and countries in the Middle East who have their goal as to destroy Israel and the Jews? What about right now? The countries that are surrounding Israel, touching Israel's border, have publicly stated, all of them, and made it very clear, their goal is to wipe Israel off the map and to annihilate the Jews. God's not finished. I mean, Satan's not finished, nor is God. I suggest to you that there will be no real permanent peace or safety for Israel until the second coming of Christ at Armageddon at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, there will be some temporary times of peace, but not long standing. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. What about the fifth big event? It's found in Genesis 12 through 15. This is the Abrahamic covenant, whereby God gave a spiritual blessing to mankind through Abraham. He also gave designated land to the Jews, to Israel, as their inheritance forever. This promise was unconditional. It was eternal. It was a one-sided covenant by God himself. Right now, Israel possesses some of that land, not all of it. This is discussed in Genesis 12 through 15, also Galatians 3 and Hebrews 6. And we're going to get into more of this later. So continue with the big picture. How do these five big events fit together in the end time? The 70th week, the 70 week, 70th week of Daniel, as well as the book of Revelation, has to do with the purposes of the second coming of Jesus Christ and what takes place in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 22. Five of God's major purposes for the 70th week of Daniel are first, to bring salvation to those receiving the Messiah before his wrath. Second, to cleanse the earth of the humanistic, humanistic false religion. Third, cleanse and bring Israel to repentance. Fourth, to restore Israel to her, the promised land, the possession of the land that he dedicated to her. Fifth, to take back the earth from Satan, who usurped mankind's inheritance of tenant possession at the fall. Remember, at our earlier class last week, I mentioned that the beginnings were the, in Genesis, and the endings were in the book of Revelation. These five big events out of Genesis, we see the impacts of Israel and mankind throughout history, throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. So what do we see in the book of Revelation? As the righteous were saved in the flood, in the old, in the old and many with other examples in the Old Testament as well, I believe that God removes and preserves Christ's church, the bride, and presents the church to Christ in heaven. This is similar to the second step of the Jewish marriage, which is um, basically a marriage, the marriage tradition. Uh, the first step was to the individual belief and receipt of the gospel of Christ, mankind accepting God's salvation proposal similar to the woman accepting the engagement offered by the man. We'll address all this in more detail later as well. In Revelation 17, 5, we see Babylon and the false religion established by the Antichrist. The Apostle John references this Babylonian false religion of Antichrist as mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of earth. Israel and most mankind will be deceived 
to worship this counterfeit religion and God that is run by the false prophet beginning in the first half of the 70th week of Daniel or the tribulation period, Revelation 13. This one world religion will probably be an amalgamation of humanism and the world's religions of today, but it could also be some new artificial intelligence developed religion, like what is being developed right now by the World Economic Forum. The Antichrist will even then in the middle of that period, seven year period, deify himself, put himself on the throne. And that's of course called the abomination of desolation. In Revelation 5, we also see something else. We see a sealed scroll. Now this scroll has to do with God's authority and his redeemer. It also represents the tenant possession deed to the earth. What takes place with the scroll is a key to the purposes and the events that take place in the rest of the book of Revelation. God takes the needed steps to begin to take back the tenant possession deed of the earth from Satan, who had usurp usurped it from mankind at the fall. He uses a program that he previously established for the Jews under the Mosaic law. It's called the Kinsman Redeemer Program. God's intent by this program was for the Jews to keep the land inside the tribe to which it was originally given. Leviticus 25 and Ruth, Book of Ruth, we'll talk about this. Now remember, all the land promised to Israel belongs to God, and Israelites were to administer it. In Israel, God established this, this established kinsman leader program, and it involved a relative who could redeem the tenant possession of God's land that was somehow lost or maybe sold by a relative. According to Jeremiah 32, a sealed deed of purchase or scroll was involved, linked back to Revelation 5. The kinsman redeemer had to do two things, however. He had to pay the purchase price and then he had to take possession of the land. From many of the scriptures, when studying this, God has extended his local Jew-oriented, Israel-oriented kinsman dealer program to all the earth and mankind. All the earth and creation belonged to him, but mankind was to administer it on his behalf under his authority, but that failed. This extended program that God has now, is now using, or is called, uh, is basically described as thus. Let me just run it through to see how this kinsman Denver program, instead of being applied to the Jews, is now being applied to the tenant possession of the earth. A kinsman, a kinsman of mankind redeems both mankind and the tenant possession of the earth from Satan who has usurped the tenant deed from Adam. He does this via the kinsman redeemer. Who is this redeemer? For purposes of taking back the earth for mankind, God uses the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Christ met all the qualifications for being the redeemer. These are spelled out in 1 John chapter one and two, Hebrews 2 and 9, Galatians 4, and other places. There were requirements to be that redeemer. Christ has already paid the purchase price, shedding of his blood. And now in the 70th week of Daniel, or the tribulation period as we refer to it, he moves to evict Satan and take possession on behalf of mankind. Christ had to be fully man, he had to be sinless, he also had to be fully God to qualify as redeemer of man, but also the kinsman redeemer of the earth. So what other Genesis related events do we see being finalized in the book of Revelation and namely the 70th week 
of Daniel. And I'd like to just highlight seven of these just as a, just as a precursor of what's going to be talked about in the future. He brings judgment upon unbelievers and the disobedient through his seal, his trumpet, and his bowl judgments. Satan, again, at this time, through the Antichrist, attempts to destroy Israel by bringing the nations against her during the last three and one half years. Satan's not done. He's trying to thwart God's plan. God brings his chosen people to repentance during the 70th week of Daniel. Christ returns in power as prophesied and saves Israel and mankind from obliteration. God also defeats Satan at the Battle of Armageddon and binds him for a thousand years. Christ takes the tenant possession of the land inheritance of the earth as the last Adam, not returning it to the first Adam who lost it, just as did the Israelite kinsman redeemer did not return. He kept and administered and maintained the land that his relative had lost. Now the seventh, Christ then establishes his rule on the earth in the millennial period, we call the millennium, and we'll cover that in much more specifics later in our um, sessions. But just to give you a quick synopsis of some of what's involved there, Christ has redeemed his bride, the church, ceremonially united at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which parallels the third step of the Jewish marriage, which are the vows and the ceremony. God then restores and remodels the current earth in the millennium, removing the curse that was linked with the fall and the loss of the tenant possession of mankind. At the end of the millennium, Christ cleanses the earth at the battle of Gog and Magog and sends Satan to hell for eternity. Then God doesn't remodel, he recreates the earth and the heavens for mankind to inhabit for eternity. And this will be the new heaven and the new earth of Revelation 21. Now, what God has cre had created and established at the beginning in Genesis has come full circle now to the book of Revelation and is reestablished according to his original desires. That's the big picture. The essential beginnings and the endings. Here's a chart that may help you understand the sequence of some of these events, both past and present. Um, you have this as also a handout, just to let you know. But as you can see in this particular graphic, we start in the history of, on the left side where both the Jew Gentiles would go through a Gentile period where the law was established. You'll also see down below the times of the Gentiles and what it expanded. You'll also see after the time of the Gentiles, basically the church, the church age, when it came about and some key events that happened in that, at which at the end is the rapture, which then introduces us into the millennial, or basically the 70, the 70 weeks of Daniel, and uh, the, the 70th week of Daniel, and also then upon its completion, the millennium, and then basically eternity. Now, the phase day of the Lord I want to go ahead and just comment on certain events and details at this point in time. The day of the Lord is used numerous times throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And as well as another term, he adds the great day of the Lord. It can be summarized as either the broad phase or the narrow phase, the day of the Lord that is, not the great day of the Lord. This specifically refers to God's intervention into the world's uh, events to judge. He can judge through other nations, or he can judge 
by his own personal wrath. Uh, examples, Isaiah 34, Zephaniah 1, Joel 3, Zechariah 14, and Revelation 6, there's others. When the day of the Lord is used, it could be any time the Lord brings judgment or wrath on a people. But also, it specifically refers to the full 70th week of Daniel 2. And I've given you a handout that talks about where this day of the Lord term or phrase is used throughout the scriptures in the context of each. Now the great day of the Lord, however, specifically refers to the last three and one half years of the 70th week of Daniel, and specifically Christ's second coming in power when God pours out his wrath on Israel and mankind. Matthew 24, 21. These are dark times. So what is this 70th week of Daniel? This was introduced in our study, Daniel study last year. And it's a time period on God's clock related specifically to Israel. And I repeat, specifically to Israel, but impacting all of mankind. It is an end time event and found prophesied in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. This time period is called the tribulation period. This probably is one of the great many proofs of God's, of, that God wrote the scriptures because of the detail that's involved in actually fulfilling the specifics that were prophesied out of Daniel. It specifically tells us what is going to take place and for what purpose. So what I'd like to do at this point, because it is so important in this study, is take a look at Daniel 9, 24 through 27, with the intent of reading it and then going through it, interpreting it and referencing the scripture in each case. So we get an understanding of what God's doing here. Let's read it together. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. A mouthful. Well, let's summarize. Let's, okay, in summary, Let's hit the major points of this. And you have a handout, that, um, and which is my next slide, which actually shares a lot of the detail that Daniel 9 is actually sharing with dates and things of this nature. And so it, uh, hopefully it'll help pull it all together. But at this point, I'm gonna go back to the slide because I'm on the prior slide on Daniel 9 because I wanna work through Daniel 9 to show you exactly how these events happened, what God's doing. So, and I will try to reference uh, the specific uh, scripture as I go through it. Okay, 70 weeks of years, 490 years are determined for Israel, beginning when the command to restore and build Jerusalem takes place, verses 24 and 25. This command is found in Nehemiah 1, verses 1 through 4, as well as Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 8. This happened on March 14th. 445 B.C. per our calendar. 
Now, the initial phase will last 69 weeks of years until Messiah the Prince, verse 25. This period equates to 173,880 days and is the exact day when Christ the Messiah rode a donkey into Jerusalem on April 6th, 32 AD, per our calendar. Matthew 21, 1 through 11 is good reference. An undisclosed time gap then takes place. That includes Christ's death, or the Messiah shall be cut off, and Jerusalem be destroyed, quoted, and the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary, verse 26. Both these events have already happened. Christ was crucified, and both Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed by Titus of Rome in 70 AD. Christ's crucifixion began what we refer to as the church age, and that's where we are right now. The question is, for how long? The last seven years will begin with Antichrist confirming a covenant with Israel, verse 27. This event triggers the 70th week of Daniel, the final seven years. This is yet future, of course. This won't begin until the last of the Gentiles have received Christ. But we don't know when this will be. However, a particular event will end that age. It's called the rapture of the church. Now, halfway through this seven-year period, the Antichrist will break his covenant with Israel, verse 27. At that time, what is referred to as the abomination of desolation will occur. This is when Antichrist sets himself up in the temple as God for all to worship, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. But after this, then Antichrist will be desolated, verse 27. Now God's purposes for the 70th week or the 70 weeks of years are also specifically outlined in this passage. They inform us further as to what will happen by the end of the 70th week and in also in the millennium. So let's see what it says. <clears throat> these, are the, these are the purposes. To finish the transgression refers to Israel's rebellion against God's rule. These are the first statements in Daniel 9, beginning with verse 24. To make an end to sin Final judgment of sin, on sin of Israel and mankind, inclusive of his wrath, also inclusive of binding Satan at the end of the 70th week. Then there's to make atonement for iniquity. That essentially means Christ's sacrificial death. Old Testament, Zechariah 12, Romans 11. We'll reference that. <coughs> Excuse me. To bring in everlasting righteousness, Messiah's future rule on earth. Hebrews 1, Isaiah 9, Revelation 19 refer to this. To seal up vision and prophecy, it's no longer needed. With Israel reconciled, the promises fulfilled, and the reign of Christ in the millennium. And then the last <clears throat> purpose is to anoint the most holy place. And this is probably uh, the final kingdom temple in the millennium. <clears throat> Excuse me. So scripture defines the 70th week of Daniel or the tribulation period to be divided into two segments according to Daniel 9, Daniel 7, <clears throat> Revelations 11 and 12. We see specific happenings. <clears throat> in the first 1260 days or 42 months. And then we see specific happenings in the last 1260 days or 42 months. The midpoint is when Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel, along with the action called, of course, the abomination of desolation. Now, beyond the purposes of all 70 weeks of Daniel, what specifically are God's purposes for this final seven-year period that we call the 70th week of Daniel? Remember, 
<clears throat> this seven-year period is essentially for Israel and the Jew. And his purposes are going to be these. And this, there is definitely overlap with those of the 70th, the whole 70, um, 70 um, period of time, the 70 years of Daniel, the 70 weeks of years. First of all, it says Daniel, uh, discipline and wrath on unbelieving Israel and the saving of the remnant of Israel. That's a purpose. Another is the condemnation of all unbelievers. All Jews and Gentiles on the earth receive God's wrath. Isaiah 26, 21 tells us about that too. To give all living one last chance to repent and believe in the Messiah or Christ. And that comes out of Ezekiel 33, 11. This happens before his second coming. Give Israel her land inheritance and then redeem the tenant possession of the earth for man. Before we get into the events taking place during this seven year trib period, let's look at one pending critical event and its potential timing. We know this as the rapture. Though this is the next big event, it's also combined with another happening that is referenced as the resurrection. So let's define both to help us understand what is actually taking place here. Let's first address the term resurrection because it is combined with the rapture event, as we'll later see. This is what happens when the dead or the living physical body is joined with the spirit to come a new immortal and spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 49. Most events are related to the sleeping or the dead who are united with their spirits and receive new immortal bodies. However, the living must also receive these new immortal bodies before they can go to their eternal state. So what will these bodies be like? We have an example. That example is Jesus Christ. John chapters 20 and 21 will share about that and give us a very good glimpse of what that body is like. The resurrection body is a definite different molecular structure or arrangement, but still has the likeness of the person involved as it did with Christ. So how many resurrections are there? This is interesting. There are two resurrection categories that are found in scripture. The first resurrection and the second resurrection. There are four resurrections under the first resurrection category. They are Christ as first fruits, the church at the rapture, martyrs at Christ's second coming, and at the end of the millennium. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 and 23, note their specific order. The second resurrection category, however, is a single event. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment, and it's specifically for unbelievers. You don't want to go there. Okay. The second term to define is the rapture. The Greek harpazo, meaning to be forcibly snatched or caught up. Its scriptural basis is found in multiple passages in scripture, but mainly in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, 5, 1 through 9, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2, as well as 6 through 8, and then also in the book of John 14, 1 through 3. Now let's take a look at what the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, and 17, since this is the, the main one that is referred to. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive 
and remain until the coming of the Lord will be by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The rapture refers to a specific event where the church, those who have believed and received Christ, believed and received Christ, are extracted from earth to join Christ for eternity. These saved are either deceased, sleeping, or they are living at the time of the rapture. Either way, they will be transformed in their new immortal resurrection bodies, like Christ at his resurrection. This is the second first resurrection category event, as the redeemed through Christ receive their immortal resurrected bodies. The rapture has to do only with the church, however. The Old Testament saints are not included in the rapture event. Note also that the rapture event, Christ does not place his feet on the earth. He receives his church or the bride in the air. He does not physically return to the earth. And therefore, this is not the second coming where he does touch the earth and stay on the earth. He lands. And we'll be discussing more of this later. Well, I'm afraid that <clears throat> we're about out of my allotted time for this session. And I'd like to have gotten more into the rapture at this time, but we're going to have to carry it over till next time. Uh, relating to this subject, however, a generous donor in our congregation uh, who wishes to remain anonymous has supplied some booklets back there that you saw on the table. These booklets are by a Jewish Christian, Amir Savarti, whom is a very pretty solid and very solid in his teaching. And this might be a real good read in your preparation for next week and even in the following weeks because he gives reference to following events after the rapture as well. So as a preview for next week, what are we going to do then? Lord be willing. We're going to continue our discussion on the rapture and highlight the four timing options for the rapture. We're going to dive into the millennium viewpoints. We'll look at the introduce the second coming of Christ, that event. We're going to dive into the details of the 70th week of Daniel or the seven year tribulation period. And following this, as time permits, we will move into events that follow the 70th week of Daniel through the end of Revelation into our eternal home. So that concludes my session for today, and I'd like to just, um, at this time, open, welcome any questions, especially those that I might be able to answer. <laughs> It yes. seems like it was from the year in which it, you just talked about there. Um, and given that there can only be a more information mm -hmm. available to us at any time in history, how do we how do we identify the, the, the theologians uh, who are wrestling with this and have interpreted it? And, and how do we how do we find the ones that that uh, okay this seems
I uh, appreciate that question. The question was, with all of the information, um, the confusion is such a huge subject, how do we know who we can trust? We can trust the Holy Spirit, number one, and he's in us. But we have to find out when we do our study of God's word, who are the commentary writers that we can, discuss, that we can actually have some trust in. And remember I said last week, don't choose just one or two. They can be very good commentators on scripture, but they may not have all the information. They may have had some presuppositions, though they, I'm sure, hope they did not. But I would suggest, for instance, I can give you a list. I've got some in my paperwork. Matter of fact, you asked about that. Um, where is it? Ed, actually. <laughs> Um, I sent him a final draft of um, the basic document that is on computer. And this is all two-sided. But basically in it, I also have references of those individuals, those sites that I feel are um, worthy of going to. And I mentioned like um, John MacArthur, there's, there's um, Wolford, there's, there's a, a number of them. And if you go right now into some of your even some of your TV channels and that, um, you will find some good sources. Always be aware that you're the Berean. You have to be the Berean. Don't accept what they say. Just like those three on the millennial, which we'll talk about next week on the millennium, uh, the views that you just shared. They sound good when you present something, but oftentimes what I've found, they don't present everything they present what most fits their goal and their belief system, whatever that belief system might be. And so it's a difficult subject. And I'm, what, am I, what I'm trying to do here, because it is so big, I have started with the big picture. I'm going to bring that picture down a little further. And then I'm gonna zero in as we go through the sessions. And as we go through them, I'm hopeful that you'll understand the big picture and how things fit together. And so you'll have some understanding then of what God is doing, because that's the key. And that's why I've repeated certain things and will repeat them again as God's purposes, because he's doing all this to accomplish his purposes. Sure, exactly. How, 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 just again, how do we identify the, the ones that, that we should pay most attention to? Well, one, I can just, yeah. You can even ask Pastor. Pastor Rich has a darn good knowledge on the end time. And he's got people like Ronald Sowers, excellent. There's, um, you know, like I said, John MacArthur. And there's, there's a multitude that are good. And I'm just, I, I don't want to name them off all right now because I won't get them all. But there are, and you could probably ask others here that, have, that are into this subject well and have understood it. But the bottom line is interpretation. Make sure the rules of interpretation are followed. Because if you miss them, you're going to miss something big potentially. And that's up to you. But we do have helps, many of them now. Technolo technology has provided that. So, anyway. Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs>
The question was is whether or not I will in my presentations cover the festivals that are related to the end times. And actually, I'm not going to. I, I can only do so much. <laughs> but there's a lot of material there as well. And I have studied it in the past, but no, I'm not, I'm not um, equipped right now to do that. But thanks for the question. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. You know, you know, the Lord is merciful. <laughs> For some of us, he just might provide one. <laughs> no guarantees. <laughs> yes? You know, this is a big topic, but it was uh, talked about predators, predators, the predators. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I will introduce them and um, some of their views. I just heard a little bit more about uh, some of their views last night. And what we're finding right now from something I heard last night too is that some of these views that are not ones that are most well accepted, like um, pre, pre, uh, predestinate, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. anyway. Uh, basically, the ones like the um, not premillennial, premillennialism is mostly accepted. And what we're finding is what was stated last night um, by these reviewers is that all of a sudden we're seeing these other older, the other, the amillennial and the postmillennial start to come forth because they're getting pushed down. They want to get back and have their views re reiterated, brought to the surface more. Now, it seems logical, but um, that's what they were sharing last night on, on one of these shows that I do watch related to the end times. Jan Markell. Jan Markell uh, Ministries, all of Tree Ministries, is an absolutely excellent, excellent sh um, show. He, she has excellent people, including Amir Safarti and others on that, on, on, her, um, on her program, sharing different subjects related to the end times and scriptures. And so it is, um, yeah, there's a lot of material out there. Yes? When do the Old Testament saints receive their resurrected bodies? I'm glad you asked that. Not that old. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, the question is when do the Old Testament saints receive their spiritual bodies? They're going to receive them at the end of the tribulation period. If you go over to that, those charts, they're actually the same chart, but one's blown up more. And you'll, get that, you'll follow it down and you will see when the Old Testament saints receive their new immortal bodies. It's not at the rapture, but it is before the millennium. So if you follow those down, they have a lot of information. Uh, I plan on going through those with everybody at a future, at a few, one of our last sessions just to give you an idea, because it's packed full of information. It even talks about the different resurrections. Thanks, though, for the question. Any other questions? Yes, when the Jews, uh, during the tribulation period, will the Jews then have a chance, uh, opportunity to uh, accept Christ? Absolutely. 144,000 Jews that are sealed are going to be sharing the gospel as well as his two witnesses. We'll talk about all that coming up. Good question, though. And the question was, will the Jews have an opportunity in the seven-year period, seven-year trib, uh, to receive Christ? Yes. Yes, that's correct. It's a uh, there's five pages in this document that you tape together, and that's what I did with those, and then I had them laminated. And it gives you a, a very good rundown, historically, of unbelievers, believers, historically, all the way through the very, very end. And it's packed full of information. Yes? Is that document available to everyone? 
at the end of the at the end of the sessions, we're, Ed and I are working on a um, website, especially Ed, and in order to put this material on the website for anybody who would like to have it or parts of it, and we'll try to make arrangements as to um, how best to do that because there will be limitations on how many um, how much action that can be on that that website. So. Uh, but one way or another, if anybody ever wants this booklet, and it's, I've added to this now uh, other information. This is just the basic booklet. I've got some of the other material that we're gonna, I'm going to be presenting toward the end. That will also be appendices to this booklet. Oh. Ed, would you like to share? <laughs> I'm not a geek. <laughs> At least, yeah. Something like that, and I think it'll be a little longer by the time it gets finished. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to make arrangements for it to be downloadable from a website, at which time, toward the end of the class, Vic will provide a link, and what's called a tiny URL, by which you can download it if you wish. Thank you, Ed. Ed was just sharing um, how this booklet and the material that I use in my presentations uh, will be made available. And it will be a website with some specific instructions on how to get that information at the end of our presentations. Any other questions? Mr. Yes. Absolutely. If God said, those who bless you, I will bless them. Those who curse Israel will be, will be cursed. Exactly true. We, the United States does need to support Israel. It'll be a huge failure for this country if it does not. And um, we're going to get into some of that, too, as well. Yes? One more comment on the Old Testament thing. Uh-huh. Where are their souls being stored? <laughs> the so-called Abraham bosom. What what happens when when the Old Testament saints pass and their souls go to hell? Okay, now we have to remember this is a good question. I haven't put myself into um, the framework a lot recently of looking at that. I think Ed has when dealing with hell on that. But basically uh, when Christ rose from the dead. You notice he went to that location. Now, it's very possible at this point, they're not going to receive their spiritual bodies, but their spirits are with God. But they don't have their spiritual bodies. They don't have their eternal bodies. And just like in this Thessalonian passage, uh, it drew, drew my attention when it just happened a couple of days ago. And I said, wait a minute, I didn't see that before. And what it was is he's going to bring, he starts it out by saying he's going to bring with them, with him, these individuals dead and alive in Christ. And then he goes into defining the rapture. And it makes you think, wait a minute, what's he mean? Well, the, re the reason I believe, there's two reasons potentially for it, is that he is prefacing his statement saying that, okay, you people all know about the second coming, but I am introducing and have been introducing to you the rapture, a different event. All the Christians during the church age will join Christ, whether they're dead or alive. He's going to be coming back with them at the second coming, yes. They'll all be with him, including the dead that were in Christ. And then he goes on to say how this is going to happen. Also, the dead in Christ, anybody is dead, they're dust, right? The physical body. But where's the spirit? Spirit is with the Lord. He's going to be bringing back the spirits when he, during these, um, these periods, when, um, like in the rapture, when we get the new bodies, that spirit's going to be joined with the new body. He's, so he has the spirits. He could be bringing those spirits back. So there's a couple 
ways you can interpret that particular verse. That's right. Jesus. Yeah, they're right now, right there. There's some unique exceptions we see in Scripture, too. And so, and that's for certain. But it's, it's, a, it's tremendously interesting to see what God's doing and what he's done and what he plans to do. And Israel is the focus. Little tiny Israel and the impacts on the entire world. Anyway, anything more? We're running late, I know, for all of you. Okay, would you join with me in a prayer to our Lord? Our gracious Father, we just want to thank you for the time you've given us this morning. Uh, I just um, I hope and trust that it was helpful to, um, to those that are here just to hear more of what your word entails when it talks about prophecy in the end time. Lord, uh, where I fall short, I just pray that you will come forth and, and minister and help individuals sort through the, the issues that they might be having. And Lord, uh, we just pray for your continued work in each one of us to help us to mature in Christ and to mature in the knowledge that you have given in your word, especially related to the end time. And we want to just thank you again for this time now as we pray and give this thanks in Christ's saving name. Amen. A uh, little quick note for wrap-up. A well, little quick note for wrap-up. Be a Berean is very important. Your presupposition in the church you were raised in has a lot of baggage with it, good and bad. So you may understand that. John MacArthur, everybody knows him. R.C. Sproul, everybody knows him. Best of Friends, had two different views on all this stuff. Two different views. They hung out together. They still spread the word of God and stuff. So you can disagree on this. <clears throat> it's fine. It's like I said last time, it's like discussing football. We can discuss basketball. One of it could be the fast break approach. One is the four corner attack. One is just Everybody shoot the own ball. This is an in-house debate, and that's what the thing is great about it. It's called mental gymnastics. Welcome to theology. <laughs> Wrestling with this stuff is fun. And if you don't think it's fun, like, like you said, we, we could take forever on this. And you got all these doctorates on both sides, three sides, four sides. It's fun to go do. I've been watching a lot of videos, listening at different views. If you listen at different views, it will make your, you go dig scriptures to see if your preconceived ideas were true or not. But that is the fun part of life. And like we do, we have this technology called YouTube now. Oh my gosh. A lot of garbage, a lot of good stuff. You have to wade through that and look at it. Okay? Thank you, guys. <clears throat>